But if that extrinsic principle is something also composed of essence and existence, what question are we going to ask? What caused that? Exactly. What, what caused that, right? right? It's so going to have to terminate in a primary cause. And that primary cause cannot be composed of essence and existence. So therefore, the primary cause of all things is going to have to be pure existence, right? So this is what we call a per accidens causal series, where the members um, have causality in and of themselves, right? But just for the camera, since I've received the mic again, I might as well just restate the previous point. And especially so we can just go over it to fully understand the argument. You're very well done. Hey. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So a per se causal series, meanwhile, is going to be a series in which each of the members of the series possess causality through another, but not in of themselves. This is like per alleud in Latin is what they call it. So, for example, if we have a train with a bunch of um, carts, no matter how many carts you posit in the train, you're never going to be able to actually get the train to move without a primary cause, which is the engine. Or, for example, if I, if I have a stick which moves a stone, right? If I have a stick which moves a stone, the stone in and of itself cannot move... Oh, sorry, the stick in and of itself cannot move the stone, no matter how many sticks I add. If I add infinite sticks, it's never going to move the stone, right? Unless there's a primary cause of that. And that's because the stick receives its causality to move the stone. When, say when I, like, swing a golf club, right? Swing a golf club. That's because the stick receives its causality to do that from you, which is the primary cause, right? So that's the distinction between per se and per accident's causal series. So when you're giving a causal argument to an atheist, the usual response, and this is what David Hume says, right? David Hume says, if I can explain the members within a series causality, I do not need to explain the whole of the causality of the series, right? But that's because David Hume is looking at this from a per accident's perspective of causality. But from a per se perspective, every per se causal chain requires a primary cause, which means that when we're talking about causal arguments for God's existence, it's going to require a cause, right? So now when we have this argument from De Ente, what we're doing is, first of all, we're making a metaphysical distinction between essence and existence. Uh, let, let's just move this uh, back a bit so there's no like sound and so we can hear each other, right? So, for, for example, right, uh, do you know what like essence and existence, well, at least like essence means here? The meaning of essence? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> form of being? Yeah, yeah, it's like the whatness of a thing, the quiddity of a thing. So like there are three humans here which instantiate a human like uh, essence, right? We instantiate that. And um, the whatness of what we are, which is a rational animal, that's what being a human is, that is our essence, right? So for anything with an essence uh, that's obviously not God, it's going to be composed of essence and existence, right? And one argument that Aquinas gives to this is in Deente chapter 4, Deente et Essentia chapter 4. He says that anything which is multipliable cannot be pure existence. Right? So we're trying to reason towards something that pure existence exists, and we're trying to say that's God. Right? Yeah. So for example, you're a human and I'm a human. What differentiates the form of humanity between us is our matter, right? This is called hylomorphism. So matter is what differentiates form, uh, uh, is what differentiates uh, the essences of things. So that we have two humans here, right? So when we're talking about that, Aquinas says that anything which is multipliable, there is a distinction between it and, it and its effects, right? So, for example, the form of a thing and its matter are distinct. But if something is identical to pure existence, its effects are not going to be pure existence, are they? So anything that's multipliable, therefore, cannot be pure existence. And because any, pretty much anything you see in creation is multipliable, it cannot be pure existence. And thus we have a metaphysical argument for the composition of essence and existence between things. So does, does that make sense so far? Yeah, yeah pretty much. Okay, yeah. So we've gotten to the point where we're saying things are composed of essence and existence, okay? 
But the problem is, is that things which are composed of essence and existence require a cause for their existence to remain in the thing, right? So either the cause for a thing's existence can be intrinsic, right? Say, for example, uh, laughter in man. Laughter in man is intrinsically caused in man. Why? Because man has the ability for um, risability, right? However, um, something can also be caused by extrinsic principles of the thing, like light from the sun or something like that, right? So, with essence and existence, the reason why existence cannot be caused by the intrinsic principles of a thing which is composed of essence and existence is because um, it, it would then be its own efficient cause, right? Which would be impossible. It would be impossible for you to cause yourself, right? Because you need to exist to then cause your own existence. Yeah. So therefore, we understand that something that's composed of essence and existence, its existence must come from an extrinsic principle, right? But if that extrinsic principle is something also composed of essence and existence, what question are we going to ask? What caused that? Exactly. What, what caused that, right? So then we get this argument to say, okay, we're going to have to arrive at something because this is a per se causal series. It's not a per accidence one. As we just discussed, this is a per se one. It's going to have to terminate in a primary cause. And that primary cause cannot be composed of essence and existence. So therefore, the primary cause of all things is going to have to be pure existence, right? What would what? The Axadarm rebuttal be to... Uh, the Axadarm's rebuttal? Oh, so an atheist will respond to this... Okay, are you asking what they'll respond to this argument to? Usually they will respond to this argument with an objection called existential inertia, right? So they will try and say that the series which exists for essence and existence isn't actually per accidence. Oh, sorry, it isn't actually per se, like we're trying to say, but it's per accidence. And if it's per accidence, the argument doesn't really work as well as we want it to, because then you have to go through like causal regress arguments to arrive at saying, oh, like a causal history of anything must be finite, right? But we have an argument to say that it must be a per se causal series. And the reason why is because when you think of, so existential inertia, by the way, just to catch everyone up to speed, is basically just saying that existence exists in a thing as a metaphysical like principle, so long as something else positive doesn't knock it out of existence and it just subsists there, right? So for example, when I paint something red, the color redness is gonna exist there until some other causal principle knocks that out of existence, right? And that's what they're going to use as an example of existential inertia. But the reason why existential inertia cannot work is because inertial properties are properties which subsist in a thing's essence, right? However, existence cannot subsist in a thing's essence because in order for the thing's essence to exist, it depends on existence, right? But in order for... Yeah. Yeah, so the essence... Yeah, so essences aren't just waiting in the wing of reality to be united to an existence, right? Essences and existences are really distinct, but you don't separate them really, right? So... They're always evolving together at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Like, essences don't just wait in the wing of reality. So an essence is going to depend on its existence to exist, right? But then the problem is, is since the existence subsists in the essence, what does the essence, what does the existence depend on? So if the essence, if the existence is subsisting in the essence, what does it depend on? An external essence. It, it depends on that essence, right? Because it's subsisting in it. But then the problem is, is they're both depending on each other counterfactually, right? Which is ontologically impossible. Like it's a metaphysical roundabout. So the objection that the atheists are going to give to this isn't really going to work. I mean, there is some further like um, nuances which we can debate about with regards to existential inertia. Like um, you might not know this, but if you want to read up on it, there's a book by uh, someone called Joe Schmidt that goes through uh, existential inertia. If you want to like really read into the topic, it's good. Also read a guy called Gavin, Dr. Gavin Kerr. He makes a few responses to that. They also had a debate, but that's the main response to their response to the argument, right? And if we have that response and it's a per se causal series, what, what's, what's it going to terminate in? 
um, external view. It's, yeah, it's going to terminate in a primary cause, right? E exactly. And that primary cause is going to be pure existence, it's going to be necessary, it's going to be what we call God. So that's just like probably one of my favorite arguments for God's existence from uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, if you want to read up on the metaphysics of this, read De Ente et Essentia by St. Thomas Aquinas. There's also a book called a guy called Dr. Gavin Kerr called Aquinas' Way to God, where he discusses this. It's a very good argument. And the thing I like about these types of arguments is I didn't just give you an I gotcha, right? I didn't just give you an I, I gotcha, atheism is false, right? Yeah, logically, we logically deduce it. Exactly. It's a metaphysical buttressing that we're building up to and we're saying that the conclusions of this view lead to God existing. And I feel like one of the big problems with Speaker's Corner that you're going to see is, especially with like the Dawa team, everything is an I gotcha argument, right? And yeah, and usually I gotcha arguments aren't very good because there's always a hidden nuance behind it that someone can reason towards, right? Like when a Muslim says, oh, Jesus submitted to God, I gotcha. Well, there's more nuance to the Christian view than that, right? Similarly, when you're arguing with an atheist, you can't just say, oh, you believe nothing created everything because there's more nuance to it. So we create a more metaphysically robust system to then reason towards God existing. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. All right, guys. So that's been the argument from De Ente et Essentia. Uh, if you guys have any questions on that, you can message my uh, channel, Thomas Apologia. I'd love to discuss this more. I think this is a very powerful argument, but you guys let me know what you think. God bless.